Hello, my name is Richard Felix and I'm going to take you on a tour of haunted Worcestershire. Some of the stories that you're going to hear are of real ghosts, of spirits, of entities that for whatever reason are still trapped here on this earth and are waiting to be sent to wherever all good spirits should go. Others are going to be of recordings, similar to pressing the replay button of a video player. They're concerned with tragic, traumatic death, murders, suicides, battles, accidents and executions. I believe that the energy used by the body or the brain when resisting death because their time hadn't actually come means that the event just before death can actually be recorded into the fabric of a building, bricks, stone and woodwork, possibly even the soil. And then either on the anniversary of that event or when the atmosphere is similar, certain people, certain gifted people actually see or hear that event again. Now what better place to start this tour than here on the top of the Malvern Hills at Ragged Stone Hill. There's a wonderful story of a monk who was at the old Little Malvern Abbey. He was a bit of a Friar Tuck figure and was sentenced by the Father Abbot to crawl up this hill on his knees every day for a year. Whilst crawling he had to be praying at the same time. He managed it for so many months and eventually died crawling up this slope. I've just walked up this myself. I know what it's like. I know what state my legs and my knees are in and I didn't crawl. So I'm surprised he lasted as long as he did. But just before he died, he cursed the hills and his curse included the words, My curse be on thee, thou heaven-blasting hill, and on those who laid this burden on me, and on all that be like as they are. And that curse also included that if a shadow was cast from this hill down into the valley, on any village, hamlet or person, that ill luck, would always follow them. So, settle back, give me your full attention, turn down the lights, and let me take you on a tour of haunted Worcestershire. And I'm standing right in the centre of Worcester, in front of the magnificent Guildhall, built in 1721. And ironically, the gates of Worcester Guildhall were made by Robert Bakewell of Derby, my hometown. You can see the statue of King Charles I on one side of the door and the statue of his son King Charles II on the other. And of course the English Civil War ended with the bloody fighting in the streets of Worcester. There's a ghost in the cells of the old prison underneath the Guildhall. So let's go in and have a look. And now I'm downstairs underneath Worcester's Guildhall. The Guildhall was built in 1721. These cells they believe could go back to that date but they know for definite that they go back to the 1860s. There's a ghost in here, the ghost of a little boy who they say either hanged himself or was strangled in this cell at the back of me here. The story is that they brought down a local clairvoyant. She came into this place and she said she got the most tremendous feeling of hands or a rope around her neck. She couldn't breathe. And she went over to this cell here and she said this 
is where the vibes were emanating from in here. She says, I can sense a little boy in here. And he was either strangled or he hanged himself. And of course, this is the place where all the people that were condemned to death would be held until being taken back to the county jail in Castle Street. Some people, of course, cheated the hangman and hanged themselves. Perhaps that's what happened to this poor unfortunate boy that was sentenced to hang here in this cell. But no one knows. But along this corridor here, this is the way that all of the condemned would take the journey along this corridor through this archway and up these steps this led up to the dock and the county courts the assize courts and go to the top the trial would take place and then of course that you be taken back from this courtroom to the place from whence you came and there to a place of lawful execution where you will be hanged by the neck until you are dead. And may the Lord have mercy upon your soul. And I'm now actually inside the commandery in Worcester. With me, Matt Harris. You are the... Marketing and events assistant for the building. And you've got just a few ghosts? One or two. Um, yes, the building's probably got about a thousand years of history on the site. Um, it's been all sorts of things. It was a monastic hospital. Um, it was a private house, uh, a printer's, a college for blind sons of the gentry, mm -hmm. and it was the royalist headquarters at the Battle of Worcester in 1651. And, of course, the Duke of Hamilton, who was the royalist commander, had his headquarters in this building. He did, yes. Um, this was his personal billet. He yeah. held his council of war where they drew up the plans for the battle here. Um, and during the battle, he was actually shot in the leg and brought back to the, uh, the building. And... Died here? Died in one of the rooms over the far side. Really? Oh, can we have a look? Of course, yeah. yeah it's way. great. This is the, uh, the room where the Duke Hamilton died during the Battle of Worcester. Yeah. Um, the Duke was the Royalist Commander-in-Chief at the battle. This was his headquarters. Um, during the battle he was shot in the leg by a slug shot which smashed his thigh back. Yeah. Brought back into the building by his men brought into this room where the surgeons basically argued about the best course of action for him. Some wanted to amputate, some didn't. During the uh, nine days of arguing he got gangrene and died of blood poisoning and he was actually buried under the floor for a couple of weeks before they moved him. Yeah, in here? In here, before they moved him up to the cathedral which is uh, where he is now. Gosh. Um, we get people claiming to feel a bit uncomfortable in here um, and we've also had somebody who said that there's a gentleman in here who can't leave this room. And they presume that to be the Duke of Hamilton, because right, he's the only person we know for definite that's actually <laughs> died, died in here. Yes. Fantastic. Right. Yes. And this is your staff room, and even this is haunted. Yes, we've had uh, one or two experiences in here. Normally when you're in the staff room making yourself a cup of tea in the kitchen, yeah. um, you get somebody open the door and walk in. Um, you'll shout to see if they want a drink as well. Stick your head around the corner because you don't get an answer and there's nobody in here. You can actually hear though the footsteps on the floor. Um, and if you look at the floor, it's actually carpet. Carpet. Yeah. But it, it's, it's footsteps on, on a stone floor rather than... Yes, yeah, on, a, on a hard stone floor, you can actually hear them. Gosh, and do they continue on? I mean, obviously you don't know where they've gone to, but they've just obviously disappeared. Yeah, they, they, from the sound of it, it's like they've only ever got into the middle of the room, so you assume that they've come to the table and they're reading something. Oh, God, and, the and they've stopped. And they've stopped here. You stick your head around, there's just nobody there. And it reduces the staff to get back to work quickly. I bet it does. <laughs> I can imagine. It's fantastic. And this is, of course, where something happened to a member of staff. 
That's right, this is the solar room. Um, one of our key holders was actually opening the building up. It was um, a morning in November a couple of years ago. And as he was over the far side of the building, making his way down here, you yeah. could actually hear footsteps behind his. By the time he got sort of at the front of this room, this door here, he could hear the footsteps in between his. As he moved on, he actually turned round because he felt somebody was behind him. He saw it a sort of, it was a haze really against here. He felt two hands on his shoulders. He was actually pushed out of the door, probably about a distance of six, eight foot. Uh, physically? Physically with pushed. Yeah, he actually, he actually had the He felt them in other words. Yeah, he felt them. He actually had the mark on his shoulders afterwards. And he sat in the staff room and wouldn't move for a while. We had to kind of persuade him that perhaps he had... A bit too much of the oh, pop the night. Well, everyone, or, or, yes, exactly. But no, he, he was um, genuinely quite disturbed by the whole thing, very upset. I can imagine. And have there been any other sighting or reported uh, incidents in here, or is it only him? It's it's really only him. We've um, When we've had members of the public in here, they've felt something, they, they, they felt a draft, they said it's very cold. Sometimes we put that down to the time of the year, and this mm. building yes, is with big gaps in the yeah. walls. Yeah. Um, but in the summer, when you suddenly get a you know, serious draft of cold air blow past you at a rate of knots, mm. you know, it, it makes you think again. Um, but that's the only physical contact yeah. that we've had. But in, but in other words, whatever haunts this room took a particular dislike to him that day. That morning it did, yeah. I mean, he had actually opened up the building for weeks and yeah. before that and nothing had happened and he's done it since and nothing's happened to him since. It obviously got out of bed the wrong side that morning. I think so. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. And of course outside, Matt, this is the area where you do your reenactments and, and mock executions and various things, but there's hauntings as well. That's right, yes. Um, we do various things out there. We've got events and all sorts of people that come mm. along and do things for us. But we have actually got a nanny, an Edwardian nanny, in a complete uniform of the day, with two children, apparently, who uh, who stand around there and, and play along the paths. Not a member of a reenactment group. That's what though. I was going to say. She's a, a real ghost. A re uh, yeah, yeah. A, a real one. Um, we had a member of the public with an evening function a couple of weeks ago who actually saw them. Um, she was quite distressed about it. And apparently there's also a photograph in existence of the lady stood by one of the pillars at the top there. Oh, I say. Now those pillars, of course, are the only original part of the, the old the, building? The old chapel, which used to stand out the back. They date from around 1080, and they Gosh. were part of the central support for the, um, the chapel, which stood out the back of the building. Amazing. And of course, <laughs> this is in another baby room. That's it, yes, one of our members of staff has heard the baby in here on several occasions. Um, we get members of the public who have heard the baby and quite distressed about somebody's leave, left a baby unattended in the building. They come and tell the attendants in the shop and we have to explain what it is. Um, we did have a medium come in not so long ago who said that there was a child who was very sick in the building um, and had died in the building, so we just kind of assume that that's the one. Yeah, yeah. Which, uh, I suppose when you can must have I mean how old this building is, the number of deaths that must have gone on in the building. Then well, absolutely. I mean the building would have seen its fair share of everything. You know, absolutely. During the Battle of Worcester itself it was used as a kind of dressing station for wounded soldiers anyway, yeah. so I'm sure a few of those passed on here. Yeah. And during its time it was a monastic hospital and its bounce we've seen sick people. Of course. Mm. Well, we're up in the attic now. Um, when the building was a college for blind sons of the gentry, this was servants' quarters, this was their living quarters, yeah. and we've got a window here which we have problems with on a regular basis. It doesn't matter how many times you shut it and what you shut it with, you'll come in the following day and the window's open again. We've tried to nail it shut, we've wired it shut, absolutely everything. It doesn't matter what you do to it, the following morning, it's always open like that. Gosh, and we can actually see um, the fittings and various things that you've actually put on it to try and to wire it to stop it. Absolutely. But it, it really, genuinely doesn't stop it, it still opens. It's, it, it's always open. And it, it'll only happen for two or three weeks a year, but it, it'll be constant throughout those two or three weeks. It's almost like it, it, it's throughout the summer months, normally the end of July onwards. Really? Is when it happens. And it's almost as if, you know, whatever's here just wants to give the room a good old airing. Yeah, now this would have been used, I presume, for servants' quarters, do yeah, you think? Yeah, absolutely. This was their living quarters. Um, this particular one would have been a bedroom. Um, next door to us is their eating room um, with the sink and everything still in place right. in their kitchen, which they use for washing as well. So, probably haunted by a serving girl or so that, that used well, to I actually work so. here, possibly died in here, nobody knows. 
So, I'm going to try and close it again, see what happens. See how long it stays closed for. Oh, doesn't seem to be a problem with that. <laughs> and we've actually been called back, for want of a better word, into the Hamilton room um, because something's happened while we've been in the building. Now, it's amazing the number of times that actually while we've done this national ghost tour that things have actually happened either to us or to people not long after we've been. The same thing happens on my ghost walks. People actually go home and I'll get a phone call the next day or something saying, something happened to me in the night. And here, um, a clock has... I mean, a lady just shouted to as we were here, didn't, didn't she, Matt, that, that a clock has just launched itself off the mantelpiece here. And, and smashed onto the floor. And, um, well, I don't know. It's a very ordinary clock. It's not an old clock. It's very modern. Um, I don't know. I have no explanation for that. All we know, and as you can see, we did not do that, did we, Matt? We did not set this up or anything like that. And, obviously, there's a poltergeist in this room. And more, more footsteps, of course. More footsteps, yes. This is an area where we have to have a, an attendant constantly here because of the, the type of exhibitions we've got. Yeah. One of our attendants normally sat on the chair through there. Um, pretty much the same sort of time of day, same day of the week. Again, for a block of time, normally a week or two weeks. And here the footsteps come across the top here and down to the first end of the first flight of stairs just here. Normally comes out to try and see what it is because that area of the building is closed to the public. Member of the public lost, so... You know, Part of the duty is to direct them in the right area. They get here and there's nobody there. And that happens to them on a regular basis. And it's always the same time of year? or Same, same time of year, same time of day, same day of the week. Wednesday? Wednesday. So it, it, it's possible that it could be a sort of around the anniversary of a, of a death. The atmosphere may be similar to when that, or whatever. Yeah, I, I mean, the building's got such a rich history oh, that we know course. so little about the individuals that lived and worked here so yeah. if anything happened and it's you know, going through those paces again yeah but they always stop always halfway stop. down halfway possibly halfway turning halfway off there. going somewhere else or, or something out the window, you know. but it always catches him he, he always comes out thinking that because this is a an exempt area sort of thing he he, he th needs to direct there's a lost the member of the public the visitor route, no no one there every time And what better place to end this incredible tour around Worcester's Commandery than this fantastic room here. That's right, this is our painted chamber. It's one of the rooms which dates from when the building was a monastic hospital. And it's the place that the monks would have brought the sick into yeah. to prepare them for death. So you've got images on each of the panels in here. Um, and there's saints. Um, who you would pray to with particular disorders. So you've got the disembowelment of St. Erasmus on the windlass. He's the saint of stomach disorder, so yeah. stomach ailments, you pray My to him. My goodness. Thomas Beckett, who sustained several wounds to the head, so he's now the, the saint of um, head troubles, migraines, so on and so forth. Yeah. And you've got the weighing of the souls, um, the Archangel Michael up there with the souls and the scales. You've got the Virgin Mary on his left and she's trying to cleanse the souls with her rosary beads yeah. and you've got the devil on the right trying to pull the souls down to hell. Gosh, so this room can be defined if you like as the room of death. I guess so. Yeah, well thank you so much for giving us an insight and taking us on this tour around the commandery. Um, you're open to the public of course most of the year, all of the year? We are yes, except for Christmas day. Yeah, and you also of course do ghost tours? We do, um, particularly around Christmas time. It's an accessible areas tour, um, which is based on a lot of the experiences by members of staff and members of the public. Amazing. Matt, thank you very much indeed. Thank you very much. I'm in the tranquil little village of Oddingley in Worcestershire. You'd never think, standing in the graveyard of the Church of St. James here, that a murder took place in 1806. The murder of the vicar, the Reverend George Parker, 
he was a little avaricious and decided that he would increase the tithes paid to him by the villagers of Oddingley. They rebelled, they didn't want it. He built a tithe barn and told them that they had to pay for the building of that barn. Five of the parishioners conspired to murder him. They hired a wheelwright from Droitwich, a man called Hemming, and he shot the Reverend George Parker in one of his fields. Hemming disappeared. Everyone thought that he'd escaped and emigrated to America. 24 years later, Hemming's brother-in-law was hired to refurbish a barn not far from the scene of the murder. When he was digging up the floor of the barn, he found a skeleton. It was the skeleton of his brother-in-law. By this time, three of the conspirators were dead. The other two were tried for murder, but acquitted. And they say that the ghost of the Reverend George Parker still wanders this graveyard at Oddingley. They say that he doesn't rest because he's still waiting for justice to be done. And in the 1960s, a young boy walking with his father, his uncle and the rest of his family. They'd heard of the Oddingley murder and they came to visit the church here. As they approached the door, they heard very low, very faint church organ music. It sounded unnatural. They didn't go in. In fact, they beat a hasty retreat back home. Not long afterwards, the uncle returned to the church to allay their fears. Something rather strange happened when he went into the church. The church is open. Why not come in? And let's have a look for ourselves. Now, entering the little church at Oddingley. This church is actually more famous for its 15th century stained glass window at the end there. When the boy's uncle returned to the church, you can see the place is not very big. It didn't take him long to realize that there was no organ in this church. And yet the whole family had heard the low, ghostly sounds of an organ here in this church. Strangely enough, of course, now there is an organ in here. But after reading the inscription, we realize that there was no organ in this church until 1980. This is the village of Lai, famous for its 900-year-old church. This tithe barn, which is the largest crook building in the whole of Great Britain, built in the 14th century for the monks of Pershore Abbey to store their wheat. And it's also famous for the ghost of Edmund Coles, who lived for many years at Lee Court he fell on hard times and became a highwayman. One day, he was talking to a friend of his who told him that he was going into Worcester to collect a large amount of money. Edmund donned his mask, took two pistols with him and laid in wait for his friend on the road. He stood in the middle of the road and said to his friend, stand and deliver. His friend drew his sword and took a slash at Edmund. 
and then galloped on home. When his friend got home, he dismounted from his horse and clutching the reins of his horse was a severed hand with blood dripping from it. It was wearing a signet ring and this friend, when he examined the ring, noticed, of course, that it was the ring of Edmund Coles. He visited Edmund the following day and found him upstairs in bed. He asked if he could pull back the sheets. And when he did, he saw that his right hand was missing. There was just a stump bound with bandages. He realized, of course, that it was his friend Edmund who tried to rob him on the highway. Because he was so severely wounded, he forgave him. Many years later, when Edmund died, his ghost terrorized the neighborhood around here. Always seen on St. Catherine's Day, riding on top of a coach pulled by four horses with fiery nostrils. It would always gallop down here towards Lee Court and take off and fly over the tithe barn and land in the River Team at the back. It was doing that to extinguish the fire from the nostrils of the horses. Twelve clergymen came here to lay the spirit or the ghost to rest. They deposited it in a pond here at Lye and filled in the pond. And Edmund's ghost has never been seen again. Not many places in England have played such a part in history as the village of Powick. Henry III was captured by Simon de Montfort here in the village. In 1642, one of the first skirmishes of the English Civil War took place in this village of Powick. And in 1651, the bloody Battle of Worcester that was raging all around this area and cost the lives of thousands and thousands of English and Scottish soldiers. Around this area of Powick Bridge, the water ran red with blood and so did the fields. Over 3,000 Scots died fighting for this bridge which they held in the name of King Charles II for well over two hours. People in the village tell me that there are very few houses that don't have ghosts. Even the butcher's shop's got a ghost and there is a ghost that still guards this bridge. A lady in 1948, who'd been doing a cycling tour of this country with a husband, a friend and her friend. They were on tandems. They were cycling over this bridge and they spotted the figure of a Civil War soldier standing on the bridge. He was wearing a buff coat and a flat, as she described as, Cromwellian hat but she could only see his shoulders and his body. He had no legs. She only saw him for a few seconds and he disappeared. Both ladies saw the figure, but neither of the men saw it. And so, of course, the men were telling the ladies that they'd had too much to drink in the Red Lion pub. But of course, this business of being headless or legless, all it means is that the level of the road has probably changed since that fateful event in 1651. And just at the end of the bridge here, a rather fitting memorial to the lives of all the Scots that died around Powick Bridge. In memory of the thousands of Scots, Highland and Lowland, who fought here far from home so well and so bravely against insuperable odds and gave their lives in devoted loyalty to each other and to their leaders. The Battle of Worcester, 3rd of the 9th, 
1651. I'm at Evesham and I'm standing in the monk's graveyard. Behind me, all that's left of the old abbey, the magnificent bell tower. In 1265, at the Battle of Evesham, Simon de Montfort, his son, and over 4,000 soldiers were killed here during this battle. Simon de Montfort was hacked to pieces. His head and his hands were put in a bag, and the bag was sewn up. And they were sent as a trophy to Lady Mortimer at Wigmore Castle. She was celebrating mass at the Abbey at Wigmore. As the messenger arrived, he burst in through the doors and walked down the central aisle and stood in front of Lady Mortimer. Just at that moment, an apparition appeared above the messenger's head and Simon de Montfort's hands were seen clasped in prayer above the messenger. Lady Mortimer was so terrified that she sent the head and the hands back here to Evesham and they were buried in the monk's church here. Many years later those remains were taken out and are now buried here in the old monk's graveyard at Evesham. And it says here were buried the remains of Simon de Montfort, Earl of Leicester, pioneer of representative government who was killed in the Battle of Evesham on August the 4th, 1265. And although Simon de Montfort, of course, lost his life, he did not lose his battle because, of course, his vision of cooperation with Parliament and Queen and King were soon realised. This is the village of Headless Cross on the outskirts of Redditch. No one really knows why it's got that name. Some think it could be to do with the crossroads, others that it has macabre connotations. It's probably due to the fact that at one time or another here was a Saxon or medieval cross. The Vikings, of course, heathens, roaming the country would knock the tops off these religious icons. Hence, of course, they would become headless. And perhaps there was one here. It also has a rather interesting ghost story going back to 1946. A young lad and his friend decided to take their motorbike down to Redditch to give it a test drive. They drove down and went into a pub and all they had all night to drink was one pint of shandy each. They set off home about 10.30 and as they were coming up the hill back into the village the bike ran out of petrol and so they had to push it up the hill. It was by this time about quarter to 11. It was dark and of course in those days there was very little traffic on the roads and suddenly they heard the clatter of horses' hooves and the thunder of metal wheels. Their first thoughts, of course, were that there was someone out riding, but they thought it rather late for someone to ride horses at that time of night. And they turned and looked. And thundering towards them was a stagecoach being pulled by four horses. And the strange thing about it all was the coachman sitting on the top was headless. They watched in amazement as it galloped past halfway up the hill and vanished. They were so concerned that they pushed the bike much harder, went home and by the time they got home of course they were still terrified, they were trembling. Their father thought at first that they'd had an accident. When they told him the story he started to laugh. And his comments were, well, I've heard the story of the headless coachman, but before, I've never met anyone who's seen it. That lad was so frightened that he spent the whole of that month 
sleeping with his bedroom light on and he never went anywhere near those crossroads again. I'm halfway up the staircase at the back of a little priest hole or hidey hole in one of the most magnificent Elizabethan houses in the whole of this country. This place is called Harvington Hall and it's about three miles from Kidderminster. It is almost totally preserved just as an Elizabethan house would have been. It's actually got a moat and it actually stands on the site of an original medieval house. And this place is unique in having more priest holes in it than any other house in England. What I'm actually doing is searching the corridors and the rooms of Harvington Hall for priest holes. Now, of course, you're not supposed to be able to find them because they're hidey holes. After Mary Queen of Scots was beheaded, she of course was a Catholic, Philip of Spain sent the Armada to avenge her death. The Pope excommunicated Queen Elizabeth, so all Catholic priests had to go underground. If they were caught, they were hanged, drawn and quartered for high treason. That sentence was that you be taken back to the prison from whence you came, and from there to a place of lawful execution where you will be severally hanged by the neck but taken down while you are still alive. Your privy parts cut off and burnt before your eyes. Your bowels and entrails to be taken out and also burnt. Your head to be severed from your body and your body to be divided into four equal quarters. And those quarters to be at the disposal of Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth, and may the Lord have mercy upon your souls. Now, with a sentence like that hanging over you, you can understand why, if Catholic priests were in a house like this, that when Queen Elizabeth's soldiers came knocking at the door, they would be sent away, scurrying, to hide in a priest hole. And I know for a fact there is one in here. I know where it is. You'd never believe it, but up there in the wall is a little room behind the oak timbers. And I'm going to find it now. And if you push these timbers, something, yes, should happen. And lo and behold, behind this huge old oak beam is a little room with a table in it. And how many Catholic priests would have had to have hide in there to save their lives? And I wonder if there are any more around. I know there are, because in fact, there's 13 here. But of course, for a video of this size, we can't show them you all. But Harvington Hall is open to the public, and I do suggest that a journey here is well worthwhile. But of course, there are ghosts, and there's a wonderful ghost story to do with the moat. So, let's go outside and have a look. And as I come out of this wonderful old Tudor hall to tell the stories of the ghosts. So Peter Corbett lived here. He had a beautiful daughter. She was having a liaison with the son of a local yeoman farmer. And Sir Peter believed that if he married her, that he would be marrying beneath himself. And he set his pack of deer hounds on the young boy. He was ripped to shreds. When the daughter found out, she was so distressed that she threw herself from her bedroom window 
into the moat and drowned. There are two ghosts around here. One, the ghost of Sir Peter, who has still been seen leading a pack of ghostly deer hounds around the wire forest. And the ghost of his daughter, from time to time, has been seen, or should I say her face has been seen, in the ripples here of this moat. And we're in Kidderminster. We're in what is reputed to be one of the most haunted pubs in England. Uh, we're in the Seven Stars. And with me, Richard, you're the, the landlord right. of the pub. Yeah. I mean, why? Any ideas? You know, why is it so haunted? Uh, I think a lot of public places are haunted because they take on a lot of character. I think this has been a pub since 1760, so it's been quite got quite a reputation over the years, I mean it's been a, a brothel, places of ill repute, smugglers' dens, all sorts of stories that we've heard over the years. Yeah, so of course with so much life, there's going to be so much death that takes place as well, yes, I would it's imagine. It's quite dark in its day, yes, back course. in the lawless days of the 1600s and yeah. the 1700s. Yeah, you've personally not seen anything here, but of course you don't have to see Ghosts, do you? That's the thing. Experience some things that we, we can't put our fingers on and we can't explain. Mm. But yeah, definitely experience things there. So I've been upstairs in the bedroom uh, in, late at night and the dogs jumped up and started barking at a corner of the room for no reason at all. Yeah. And it was two days after that when he was lying in bed again and it was late at night and the girlfriend's jewellery box, which is quite a cumbersome thing, yeah. just fell over onto its lid. Uh, and it was on the floor, so it didn't fall over, it was on the floor, and yep. it rolled over onto its lid. And the dog didn't make a sound that day, but me and the girlfriend both sat up in bed, looking round, and we couldn't see anything, so it was like underneath the covers, and back to, back <laughs> yeah. to sleep, hoping it would leave us alone. Yeah, but I mean, basically, you, you, you accept it, you live with it, don't you? It hasn't done us any harm. No. I mean, we've got, you know, we live here, and we've got a three-year-old son now, and... Yeah. You see, all four of us, I suppose, or we all seem to get on. Yeah, I mean, does he... Has he mentioned anything yet about sort of anyone coming in his room or because the children do tend to yeah. sometimes have imaginary friends? Well, that's what we call them anyway. Uh, I don't know. He hasn't let on us yet. No, it could come later. So you just know, just just keep an eye because they do Best often do this. Anything happens, I'll be yeah. on the phone. Yeah, but of course the the dog senses it. The dog knows that something's, something's going on. Yeah. We used to run into this bar that we're in now. Yeah. Uh, about quarter to one in the morning we used to have another member of staff work for us, Abby. Yeah. And she had a dog. And they both used to run in here at quarter to one on a regular basis and we've never fathomed out why. But apparently in this room it's been known for things to fall off shelves and hit the floor and fly off shelves and hit people. But as I say, I still haven't experienced anything. Yeah. There's a lot of people that have got a lot of interesting stories. Yeah. But, but it tends to leave you alone. Yeah, it tends to leave us alone. I mean, would you jump out at me and go boo? <laughs> there you are, you see. <laughs> but now there's also problems, of course, with the cellar. The cellar's quite an interesting place, yeah. I mean, cellars are always cold. Of course, damp. yeah. But I mean, those our ones are slightly cold and slightly damper than most. Mm. And there's uh, three tunnels in the cellar. One goes off to another pub in the town. Yeah. One goes off to a church and one goes out to Hercut Village somewhere. I mean, they've been boarded up now. But apparently that was part of the smuggling, the smuggling days of the church. Really? And I know for a fact that, that, that possibly before your time, a um, couple of lads down in the cellar doing some painting, and uh, they heard footsteps going past them. At first they didn't even bother to turn because lots of people had been popping down to see what in fact you know, they were doing. And then they heard these footsteps, they stopped by, by them and they turned and there was this sort of grey, hazy lady down in the cellar apparently and they ran. I found this, this, this grey figure that has been seen quite a lot. Oh, right. I and mean, it's been seen moving across the back bar yeah. by some of the customers. But as I say, I've never seen it. I wish I had, because, you know, I just oh, like yeah. to turn around and say, oh, I've seen the ghost I have. Of course, yeah. And it's been reported that everyone else has seen it, so I must be right. But yeah. apparently it is true that it's like a 
can't make out a face or anything. It's more of a grey mist. Yeah, a grey figure. The bar. Yeah, yeah. Who knows? Your, your day may come. You never know. Um, it may be the spirits behind the bar talking when some of the customers see yeah, things. Good you good never good know. Day. But uh, I mean, you know, the atmosphere in the place alone is is something fantastic. It's a very interesting pub, that's yeah. for sure. Yeah, Richard, that is fantastic. Thank you very much indeed. Enjoy Cheers. catching ghosts. Thank you. Hello, my name is Richard Felix and I'm here at my base at the Old County Jail in the centre of Derby. This place over the last 150 years has been a place of terror, torment and of course death. And that's one of the reasons why this place is as haunted as it is. I've chosen Derby as the catalyst for the national ghost tour of Great Britain. Over the last 10 years, I have taken in excess of 95,000 people on a ghost tour somewhere around the Midlands. And of course, have spoken to many of those people on the tours and of course have realised just how fascinated people are by ghosts. This is the reason that we have chosen to do this tour. The video that you've just watched is a part of that series, but I want your help. If you have a ghost story, then please either email me or write to me at the address that you'll see at the end of this video. Of course, you must remember that after speaking to so many people, I think I have an ability to be able to see through some of the stories, to be able to differentiate between a story that is true or a story that's made up. And of course, you must remember that eight out of ten ghost stories can be explained but it's the other two that you've got to worry about. I hope you've enjoyed the video. Do sleep well and don't have nightmares.